The Boss Mom Podcast is a supportive space for mothers, whether expecting, new, or seasoned, wearing multiple hats, corporate babes, entrepreneurs, or serial workers, to come together, uplift each other, and discuss our challenges and celebrate our wins. With that being said, all right, Boss Mom, let the movement begin. Hey, Boss Moms, welcome back to the Boss Mom Podcast with your host, Ashley White. So happy that you all are able to join me again for another episode. Um, Hope you all had a great week. This week, we're going to be talking about the strength of a mother. Um, I think a lot of times people, I don't want to say forget, but maybe disregard um, how much mothers have to endure and how much we don't necessarily talk about all the time um, when it comes to how we feel about certain situations or just the... um, amount of stress that we put on ourselves when it comes to things that surround our family, whether it's with our child, our significant other, but even just our own stressors that we go through. Um, So I felt like this topic was going to be a good one um, to talk about. And I do have a guest as well, Miss Jennifer um, Alquin, who is going to be sharing her story. Um, Specifically, I wanted to bring Jennifer on this um, particular show because I we've been Facebook friends. We went to college together. Um, and if you haven't been listening to my podcast, I attended Bethune Cookman um, University in Daytona Beach, Florida. So um, I noticed Jennifer's story when it came to her daughter's um, heart condition, and it really touched me. And just I'm the type of person like I hate seeing kids and babies having to go through things. Um, especially at such young ages, you know, that, you know, they just have no control over. It really just breaks my heart having to see that. And so when I saw Jennifer's story or her daughter's story, um, I definitely felt inclined to reach out to her and learn more about what her daughter was going through um, with her heart condition, but also see if it was something that she'd be comfortable sharing um, with others, specifically on my podcast um, as it relates. So I want to give Jennifer an opportunity to introduce herself. Sure. Thanks, Ashley. Um, So as Ashley said, my name is Jennifer Aliquin. Um, I'm a new mom to a baby girl named Camila. She is four months old next week. Um, My husband and I have been married for It'll be six years in July, um, together for almost 13 years in June. And, um, I, we were hoping to have a baby last year and and everything kind of went pretty smoothly. He got out of the military. We settled back home in Florida. I got pregnant and, um, we found out we're having a baby girl. Um, and then during our 20 week anatomy scan, we got some kind of devastating news at the time, but. Anyway, we'll go through that journey in a minute. Aside from that, I am an IT project manager for a government contractor, Um, a beauty guide for Lime Life. I also coach volleyball here at the local high school. So lots going on outside of just being a mommy and trying to figure out everything pertaining to mom life. Um, But that's kind of me in a nutshell. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for joining me and um, sharing your story and what you and your husband are experiencing with your beautiful baby girl. So I do want to um, let the listeners let the listeners know what the condition is. Um, Number one, what the condition is that baby girl is experiencing um, and two, how you all found out and your overall, you know, reactions, as I'm sure that was not, you know, great news to, to find out, but just learning about that experience. Yeah. So I have my cheat sheet here too, so I can say it very um, politically correct. And then I can say kind of like the high level. So my daughter has what's called hypoplastic left heart syndrome, AKA HLHS. Um, So I'll read from the definition. It says an underdeveloped left side of the heart, the aorta and the left ventricle are too small and the holes in the art, in the artery and septum did not properly mature and close. So basically for some reason, there's still no known cause um, for congenital heart defects in general, especially with this one, but uh, she, the left side of her heart never developed in the womb. 
So um, it's super, super tiny, it's visible, but it never grew and it's non-functional. So she basically was born with half a heart, um, just the right side. So we went in for our 20 week anatomy scan. My husband and I were super, super excited. Um, we knew it would be like a longer ultrasound. We get to see her and um, we really had no expectation of, of anything going wrong. I mean, we were uber positive and most of my pregnancy, I was kind of anxious. Like I would talk to my mom and say, you know, what if something's wrong? And she kept telling me, you know, you're both young, you're healthy and kind of reassuring me. Um, so that's kind of how we went in. We had no thoughts of anything going awry and we were really excited and we get in there and you know, the ultrasound tech is going through and finding all the organs and everything. And she got to the heart and she was just sitting on the heart for a long time. I want to say like 20, 25 minutes. And I was just kind of like, is everything okay? You've been looking, I asked her, you've been looking at the heart for a long time now. She goes, yeah, I'm just struggling to see all four chambers. And I just don't know if it's like the baby. And she asked me to move around. She's trying to poke her. And she's like, maybe I'm just not getting like a good visual. Um, she's like, I'm going to have you come back. This is a Friday. So I'm going to have you come back on Monday so the doctor can come and do it. Right. I'm like, okay. So we obviously leave that appointment super uneasy. And I'm a mess. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, why couldn't she see it? And Gabriel was totally fine. He was just saying, you know, she's probably in a bad position. Not a big deal. Come back Monday morning. So we come back Monday morning. And the doctor comes and he's like, yeah, I, I can't see the other half of the heart either. It looks to be either really, really small or the right side is super, super big. And he's like, I'm not the person to like officially diagnose this. Um, I'm suspecting there's some type of defect with your daughter's heart. Mm -hmm. And so immediately like the tears start coming and I'm like laying on the table and my husband's holding my hand and he's like I'm so sorry and he's already like apologizing and um he's like I'm gonna refer you to a high-risk doctor in Orlando so we go to I think like a week or two later we go to the high-risk doctor in Orlando he sees the same thing he's like I see that the left side of the heart is severely underdeveloped he's the one who actually gave us the HLHS diagnosis so we finally put a name to it um, he's like, but I want to send you to a pediatric cardiologist to validate my diagnosis. Yeah. So another week or two later, we go to the pediatric cardiologist and he confirms his diagnosis and they both review, like they have big heart diagrams that they pull out and tell you kind of what it is and what to expect. And it was really, 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 um, shocking obviously and mm -hmm. devastating I mean I felt like every time we went for a second opinion second third fourth it, I told my husband like I feel like I'm getting beat up over and over again like you go in just like super hopeful that this is all a mistake everything's wrong doctors are wrong they just can't see she's so tiny mm -hmm. you know you think of all these things in your head to make it not be true but then after like the fifth and sixth time you're like okay maybe I need to start like accepting this diagnosis and just trying to process that and trying to enjoy your pregnancy and trying to be positive and all the hormones. It was just like a super, super hard time yeah. for both of us, I guess. So it, I don't know if you want to go into kind of like, there were some really, really challenging days, I guess. I mean, after the initial diagnosis, I was obviously Googling everything I could yeah. um, to understand. And it was hit or miss because a lot of the surgeries and um, the care for the, this heart defect um, was recent. So like the surgery she got at nine days old was conceived in the 80s. Um, so like the oldest living people who had it are, are like, 37, 38, they're not even, you know, in late age yet. So yeah. they didn't have a lot of like life expectancy and a lot of what you, you saw, like if I wasn't careful with, you know, when the article was written, you would find a lot of, you know, this is um, terminal, you know, talking about, um, you know, aborting and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. 
really challenging to have like that discernment and try and stay positive throughout the whole process, not even knowing what to expect at all. Right. No, that's, I mean, I totally get what you mean when you were saying going into the anatomy scan, like you were having all these thoughts and talking to your mom because I was the same way. Like, I don't know what to expect. And then to come out and hear, you know, negative news like that, like I can, I can't say how I know how that feels because I don't, but just imagining like having to bear that, you know, information and then still have, a stress-free pregnancy, right? Because they want us to be as happy as we can, right? (laughs) When we're pregnant and um, just, I don't know, that that's just, to me, is so disheartening. And it's a blessing though, that she, you went through the pregnancy, you know, successfully and she's here. Um, She's so freaking cute, like, yeah. As I'm preparing for motherhood, like just my heart goes out to you all um, and just having that strength. Like, and I think that's the part, like why, like even from the title of today's podcast, like just the strength of a mother, because everyone expects you to be strong for your kid. Right. And so, I mean, and she's so young, like, you have to be positive, you know, and have that strength for her to just be there as she's going through, even though she doesn't know what's going on, you know, being that she's still, um, still a baby, but it's just like, does mommy get a break? Like, when do you have time to really just process for yourself, you know, like, and I think, so like, just thinking about that, like, how did you like going through your pregnancy How did you keep yourself uplifted, like in spirit? Um, So we're very much so into our faith. Mm -hmm. Um, We prayed nonstop about this baby. And my husband was such a strong force in me staying uplifted. And he kind of just let me feel everything you know like Mm -hmm. when I was sad he would just sit there and I'd be sobbing on his shoulder uncontrollably and he would just hold me and he kept it together and he prayed over us he prayed over my belly he was just like you know God's promise is still true and this baby is going to be perfect you know Mm -hmm. um and that was really hard and probably could be a whole nother podcast um Mm -hmm. our faith walk through this journey Mm -hmm. how challenging that is because nothing ever will prepare you for seeing your baby be sick or hurting and especially this young it's just like the most traumatic thing you'll ever experience I don't wish this on my worst enemy like I can't express the like the level of pain that I felt prior to her coming into this world because I had no idea even what she would, I'm like, what if, you know, she had, cause they even said there was such a big range. So this diagnosis, HLHS, there's a huge range of ways that things can happen. Like mm-hmm. I met other babies and other parents in the ICU and we were there for five weeks and they would say, oh, my baby has HLHS, but they've been waiting on a heart transplant since the baby was born. So they've been living there mm-hmm. or they have HLHS, but they also were born with other genetic, um, like malformities or things like that or um there's been many who are linked to like who have down syndrome or trisomy 18 or other issues and that they couldn't find in in utero or whatever um so all the doctors would say those type of things because they want to cover all their bases they don't want to be too optimistic and then you know something not come out the way that they had said so they're like you know she does look based on the ultrasounds just to have and I had the genetic testing done and everything and that came back um clean and they're like but you know she may have other heart defects that we just can't see because she's so small and so all of this was like really weighing on our on our mental on my mental like 
there were times where I didn't accept the diagnosis and that was a big part of Gabriel's journey too. Before she was born, he was just like, until I meet her, until they confirm that this is like real when she's out of your belly, I'm not accepting it. Like she's going to come out perfectly fine. I don't like, he was overhearing the doctor say it. So we kind of had to balance each other because at first I was like, you're right. Like, but I don't, I don't agree with them either. I don't believe it. You know, I believe God for this miracle and her heart is going to come out whole. And this is all going to be, like I said, a big mistake and you know, all that stuff. And so we kind of kept going that course. Like we would pray every day. I had my days where he would come home and one day he came home and like all the lights were off and I was just on the couch under a blanket, just sobbing. Yeah. And on lights, like they were drawn. It's like I just couldn't take it. I was just like, I can't take this weight right now. I feel like I'm being crushed. Like everything I've ever hoped for and wanted for is like crumbling. I just felt that was probably one of like the lowest times of my pregnancy. And I just had to like stay strong in God's promise. I felt like that was the biggest thing. Like we went through a lot two years ago when my mom was diagnosed with cancer and some people who follow me on social media also followed our journey with that and I took care of her full time Mm -hmm. and um it was like at that point in my life I thought that was the hardest thing I would go through and then you know right after she goes into remission I get pregnant and it's kind of like oh my gosh like the light at the end of the tunnel and I look back at all the challenges that I've been through in my life and God's never put me through something in vain Mm -hmm. whether it be college like playing division one and that having its own nuances and struggles through my younger years then going into corporate america and there's just been like so many big things that have happened in my life where i'm like i don't know if i can do this yeah. and i don't know how i'm gonna get through it and god always carries us and after the fact i look back and i'm like i don't know how i did that by the grace of god but it just refines you and molds you the difference with this one i think is that those ended, like those seasons in my life ended with congenital heart disease. A lot of people will say, oh, is she cured after the surgeries? And they're not. So it's not something that can be cured. There is no cure. You're going to be dealing with this for the rest of your child's life, seeing a cardiologist, you know, not knowing whether they're just sick because they have a cold or their heart's not working right. Or, you know, it's kind of like having to triage what they're going through at the time. But I'm totally going off of your original question. Our no, faith is how I say it. That's, <laughs> that's what this this is here for us to just <laughs> talk because I know I'll probably ask a question and then end up in a whole nother spill on something else. So no, but like just even you just talking about um, dealing with your mom, like I did not, I did not see that story. Um, and I'm partially because I'm like halfway on Facebook and halfway not on there. I really go on there for work, but then I see personal stories and stuff. So, um, but no, like even just you talking about that, I feel like women in general, like despite being mothers, like just taking that part out of the equation, we don't always talk about how we feel about things in general. And I feel like a lot of times, like we are the backbone. Like I know, like when it comes to guys, society says, you know, don't be emotional. You know, you're a man, like you're supposed to be the strong one. Um, But I feel like with women, we are too. Like we are generally like the backbone of the family. Like, you know, and we just don't talk about how things feel. So to have to go through continuous situations, you know, if they're like back to back and like, that's just hard. And so even with you saying like your hardest day was when your husband came home and saw you like sobbing under a blanket, like to me, I'm just like, you know, we need that sometimes we need that release time, you know, whatever, if it's going to cry. And I'm a crier. Like my boyfriend can tell you like, we had a conversation today and he's like, why are you crying? And I don't even know. Like, that was my, my answer. I'm like, I don't know. I think just all the emotions from everything that I've been thinking over the past week or so, like, it's just coming into form. Like, I'm not sad. I'm not mad. And 
just, I think my body is just reacting, you know, to it. But, you know, it's okay to take those times to where you just have to decompress. And however you do that, if it's crying, if it's, I don't know, some people like to take walks or whatever they like to do to soothe them. But, you know, I just really think that as women, we're just, we address our emotions, but not all the time because we feel like we have to be strong, you know, for others. And so just being able to um, acknowledge your feelings, because at the end of the day, you, you did have to carry her. You are mommy, you know, when kids get sick or whatever, like most times they're looking for mommy like or anything really like I'm hungry where's my mom like you know so um how so how has it been um I know she's four months now like going through um the surgeries like does how how has that experience been for you all like do you feel like now that she's here you see the diagnosis like you see how it's affecting her like I don't I know it doesn't get any better like I'm sure it doesn't you know from how you probably felt when you first found out and just going through pregnancy but now that you've read you know more about the disease um no I don't want to say disease condition I'll say condition um <laughs> how how is that like altered I guess how you feel like are do you feel like you're more positive now because you're a little bit more knowledgeable about what's going on yeah yeah so I definitely feel in a different place than I was when she was in my belly mm -hmm. because she was in my in my belly I felt like she was safe right like at, at the very least I knew she was thriving in there and that kind of put me at peace and that was probably one of the better parts of prenatally of having her is like everything looks great she's so good so what happens is I'm um, just some background when babies are in utero um they obviously don't breathe oxygen so mm -hmm. their, their blood flows differently um so they have a hole in their heart that is open um to allow like oxygenated blood to flow and then when they come out into the world, that hole over the first 24 hours closes um, mm -hmm. and then they start breathing oxygen and oxygenate and deoxygenate, all that stuff. You can like Google that because I haven't memorized yet, but, um, but the blood flows differently. So once that hole closes um, after the first 24 hours, they're expected to breathe on their own, et cetera. So with these babies, um, they have to get put on what's called prostaglandins. So it's basically a life-saving medication that keeps that hole open. So they're breathing as if they were still in your tummy. Um, so I got her, I got to hold her for maybe five minutes and they took some pictures and then she was rushed off to the ICU. She did one night in the NICU and then the rest of her stay in the cardiac ICU. Um, so that whole journey, we spent five weeks in the hospital where we go to Shan's Children's Hospital in Gainesville. It's tied to the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most amazing hospitals in the world. Um, that experience was super, super challenging. I wouldn't, it's kind of hard to compare them because at that point I saw her and when you see her, when she came out, you're like, oh my God, she looks perfect. You right. know, like, let's just take her home. And that's probably one of the saddest things, right? So you talk about hormones before baby. I was not prepared. Obviously, it's my first child mm -hmm. for postpartum hormones. That is like a whole nother level nobody prepared me for. Like, if I thought I was crying before she came, the two weeks after she was born, I, I think I cried enough tears like to fill the ocean. I was, I was swollen. I was in pain. I just wanted my baby. Um, but I'd say it's a different right now where we are today with her about to be four months old. I am more hopeful than ever. Mm -hmm. Um, I've met more parents who've experienced this. I've, um, on social media found adults who are living with this condition mm -hmm. that gives me so much hope. I follow a lot of research. Um, you know, I think about the parents who their kid was born with this 30 years ago mm -hmm. and they had no choice. Like they would literally have their baby and their baby would die. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, I think we're so fortunate that it's happening now in 2021 and we have a choice and we were able to go through this and have a baby that's thriving. And, you know, not everybody has the same outcome as Camila. And I can't even say that we're done, right? So she has a surgery in the next couple of weeks and I'm dreading it. Um, we don't have an exact date yet, but shortly after her four month mark, they're planning it and she's already cleared for it. And it's less complex than her first one. Obviously she's grown and she's stronger now. Um, but it's still, I mean, they're taking your baby back and they're opening their heart and she's going to be put on a ventilator and bypass and you just see them go through so much and there's nothing you can do, which is the hardest part, you know, like we talk about being strong for our kids yeah. and I almost, and this is like, no, if I, I give people so much grace and I appreciate all the love that everybody has poured over our family and Camila mm -hmm. through this. Um, but a lot of times people, their go-to comments are like, you're so strong or you're such a strong mom and stuff like that. And there was a point where I was just like, I don't want to be strong anymore. Right. Like I would give anything to just re you know what I mean? Like not have to carry this. Nobody wants this. No mom is like, yeah, I am strong. I, you know what I'm saying? Like right. in the back of our brain, we're like, why, why? Like, why us? That was a big part of this journey where there, I have my days, even now. I mean, I'm only four months into being a mom. Right. Um, and I'm kind of, my mindset's kind of morphing. It's not why God, it's more like, okay, God, what do we do with this now? Like, how right. can we advocate for this? How is Camila supposed to help others who are coming, you know, being born with this? And it's something that we had no idea, you know, we're two healthy adults and, you know, everybody says, Oh, what do you want a boy or a girl? And the common answer is I just, as long as it's healthy. Yeah. And exactly. You never, I, I had to go away from saying like, I know when I first got pregnant and people were asking me that and I automatically was like, I want a boy, like, because I have my <laughs> reasons why I want one. But then I just, you know, thought about it. I'm like, honestly, I just want a healthy baby. Like, Mm -hmm. Like you said, like nobody wants to go through that. Nobody wants to say, hey, God, pick me to be the strong person to, you know, <laughs> battle this, you know, like, so no, I totally, I totally understand that comment. Like, maybe I don't want to be strong this time. Or how do you even know that I'm strong? How do you know that I'm being strong? Like, you have no idea. Like, I literally could be crying every day, you know, even though I'm sharing my story, okay. like, you really, I'm, I might not be strong. And so now I have to actually take that into consideration when I'm, you know, saying comments like, maybe you shouldn't say that. Like, I try to, you know, really just say like, you're in my prayers, like, because you really cannot, unless you are going through that, like how you say, you, you see you're a part of communities where people are sharing their stories that are actually even either as the parent have gone through it or themselves have gone through it. And so they can sit here and say they understand your struggle, your pain, you know, but, you know, just maybe finding other encouraging, encouraging words, like, because at the end of the day, like, in a sense, it's kind of like, well, I don't have a choice but to try to be strong, like, yeah. because I'm in this space. I've talked to other like even my mom, my mom and I are best friends and, you know, we obviously went through a journey together and now she's, you know, supporting me through this. And I was just like, I don't, there was no other choice, right. To me, because that's the type of human being I am. And she's like, honey, there were other choices. She's like, you could have not had the baby. Every doctor offered you an out and you didn't take it. You could have put the baby up for adoption. I mean, there's actually children in the ICU that their parents found out and left them and nurses adopt them oh yeah it's just like absolutely I'm like no like I that wasn't even never even crossed my mind right and she's like so don't sell yourself short and my husband says all he's like don't take away from the fact that you are a strong mom and everything that Camila has endured 
the level of care she's gotten. So as I mentioned before, my husband kind of detached himself when we were, when I was pregnant he kind of just stayed in the faith and kind of was the pastor of our home for that journey. But I was the, I'm the planner. I mean, I was like, I'm praying for her, but at the same time, if God's telling me that this is going to be our journey, I'm, I set up consultations. We were going all over Florida, talking to surgeons, trying to find the best of the best. And, you know, He's like, we are where we are. She is doing so well because of everything you've done for her. So don't take any of that away. Like she wouldn't be thriving. She wouldn't be getting the best care in the nation. She wouldn't be, you know, where she is today if it wasn't for the fact that she had an amazing mom. And like, I take that to heart. And I, I think, wow, I don't, I just saw that as me doing the best that I could for my baby. And I'll always do the best for her. Like, she didn't ask to be here. I wanted her here and I'll do whatever it takes. I mean, I literally told people, I'm like, I'll sell my home. I'll sell my body, whatever. I don't care how much, like, I don't care how much it was or it's just, you know, that's a whole, I need to make my own podcast actually. Something, all these topics. <laughs> no, but that's, like, that's real. But that honestly, like turns it back to just what I was saying, like just the strength of the of the mother, because you instantly, like even though you were still pregnant, but like I mean we're still mothers when we're pregnant in my eyes, like yeah. Because yeah. I, I told my boyfriend as soon as I found out I was pregnant, I was like instantly in mommy mode, like okay I can't do this, I can't do that, you know. And so you instantly, like even though it was a pain that you were feeling, instantly jumped into okay how do I protect my kid? Like we're gonna if this is what we're gonna go through, like we're going to go to the best of the best. We're going to find out as much information as possible, like, so that we're informed, you know what I'm saying? And that is what I mean when I just say, like, the strength of a mother, the strength of a woman, like, it's putting your feelings to the side for the betterment of your family. And that's exactly what you did. Like, so I agree, like, with your mom and your husband, like, you do definitely have strength, um, as a mom, as a woman, and definitely, you know, don't discredit yourself because you're doing what you have to do to make sure that if she's going going to, now that we have acknowledged and accepted that this is, you know, what is happening, like, I'm going to make sure that you get what you need when you need it by the best that we can get it from, you know, and that's just, Honestly, it's like, that's, that's what we do as mothers. That's what we do as women. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I just get so amazed at how much we can take on sometimes. Like, and even though we doubt ourselves, cause I, I have my times too, where I'm like doubting the situation or just like my boyfriend's like, let's, you need to be, you know, um, what's his saying? You know, not. Uh, problem based but solution based okay you know the problem now what's the solution like it's no need to sit here and cry you know since I'm a crier and all (laughs) like you know just pick up the pieces and like let's keep going and so I mean he's my backbone in that regard like because I will sometimes let things overwhelm me and even though it's like I'm I'm fighting it at the same time but I'm sometimes it is a little hard for me to see the end of the road or see that solution because I am so tied up into whatever the situation is and, and sitting here like, well, why is this the situation? (laughs) And it's so weird because like being pregnant and, you know, postpartum that time is such a, I'm not a crier. So I'm like totally opposite. I don't typically cry. I'm Mm -hmm. not a very emotional person I'm very kind of matter of fact so if I'm feeling something I just tell my husband hey like you're bothering me or hey I feel this way you right. know um so I think for him to see me so emotional so broken was like oh my gosh I need to take care of her because yeah. you know she's carrying my child and it it was helpful for me to have somebody who allowed me to feel mm-hmm. you know, that was like so, so big. And part of me, you know, looks at our situation and I look at the things that we've been able to make possible for this little baby. And had we had been anybody else, right? If we didn't have the means, if we didn't have insurance, if we didn't have a good car, if we didn't have, you know, the means to afford the hotels, to afford everything that we did to make 
her have the best chance, Mm -hmm. you know, this could have turned out totally different. And I think that even though we didn't get the miracle that we necessarily prayed for, like, you know, her heart wasn't healed in the womb and stuff like that. I, I think that there have been so many other miracles throughout this journey. Mm-hmm. And it's so important, I think, for people and moms and everybody, I think in general, to not everything will come to fruition in the way that you make it up in your head or the way you want it to happen. But there's still so many reasons to be grateful mm-hmm. and to be, you know, positive and to be blessed and allow God to use your situation, whatever it may be. Even if you have a perfectly healthy kid, you're still going to go through stuff with your kid. You're still going to have your own journey with your kid. Mm -hmm. Um, And to help other people or to reach other people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just like you were saying, you have your moments where you're crying or you have these anxieties or you have like moms I feel like even if my kid was perfectly healthy, I would still have anxiety because you have this little human that you just brought into this world. And yes, dads love their kids, but they weren't in their belly and you just have this bond. It's so crazy. And it's so instant. Like as soon as you carry that child on your chest, when they hand it to you after you give birth, it's like this immediate overwhelming sensation of love. Like I can't really put into words. Mm -hmm like emotional talking about it because I'm I'm so excited for you because it's going to be the best day of your life but counting down the days literally like I'm sitting in the rocking chair already just rocking my belly like (laughs) that's what I did at her nursery I was like oh I can't wait yeah well I thank you um for sharing your story um this is very powerful to me and just watching you all go through this, even though I'm like not there, but just you share on Facebook. So I feel like I'm going through this journey with you guys, but it's just like, I'm like, oh, like you say, like, she looks so perfect. Like literally she does. I'm like, she's like a little baby doll. And I just, you know, I really pray for her strength and her upcoming surgery and praying for you all strength as parents as well. But I know God has you all covered and I'm very much, strong in my faith as well so you know I hate to say God you know gives battles to tough his toughest soldiers but I am a firm believer in that just because like he has in my he has the last day no matter what any doctors say and please listeners we are not medical experts you know this is simply <laughs> just <laughs> our experience and my opinion but you know I God has the final say so you know, he is going to carry her through this. Um, and I don't know. So does she get a, is it a transplant list? Like, I know you said there's no cure. Do they work to like? So the three surgeries basically reconstruct her heart. Um, so okay. the first one is just like a bridge. So when babies are born, their hearts are about the size of like a strawberry. Mm-hmm. they're super super tiny the vessels I mean it's literally like paper thin and these surgeons are going in by hand so there's mm-hmm. no robots or anything you can imagine the amount of anxiety feeling before that but um anyway they put like a plastic tube tiny mm-hmm. tiny 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 to reroute the blood so it's circulating and then in those first few months of life um basically she's growing stronger the heart's getting bigger okay. she'll outgrow that little tube Um, which is what she's about to do. Um, And then they go in and do kind of a second phase. So they do some reconstruction, put that little tube in, hold them over. Um, She's technically considered like critical right now. So that's why we're keeping her in a tiny little bubble and only a couple of our family members have met her, especially with COVID and all that stuff. Um, um, And then the second surgery, they'll take that out. They'll do some more reconstruction. Mm -hmm basically allowing the heart to pump and do everything it needs to do with just the right side. So taking off or taking out and rerouting stuff. Um, And then technically she could live the rest of her life with that second surgery circulation, but it's not optimal. There's a lot of risks to it. So there's a third one she'll get around three to four years old. Once she's much bigger, heart's much bigger. She's a lot Mm -hmm. stronger at that point. Um, And that'll be it. Uh, God willing till forever if for some reason 
So we'll see her cardiologist for the rest of her life Mm -hmm. and they'll scan her heart and check the pressures and stuff. If they find that her heart's not thriving Mm -hmm. with these reconstructions, um, then they would put on the transplant list and that's something they would pursue. But you know, that comes with its own, um, own complexities, having a heart from another human being. So um, our hope is that after the third surgery, we are good to go and we'll just see the cardiologist and we'll do our best to have her live the most amazing life, you know? Um, But right now she's just a normal baby. I mean, she's doing all the normal baby things and that's what our expectation is. And, you know, she hates tummy time just like the rest of them and (laughs) all her milestones and stuff. So it's been a really great, I have never been more proud of anybody in my whole life and she won't remember this but I will definitely remind her when she's old enough and be like look at everything you did right you know? so young so strong <laughs> crazy well I definitely just everything you just shared like definitely prayers out to her and I know her journey will be great and you know like you said just continue to be an advocate, um, and, and put the knowledge out there because I have never heard of this. So like, I love doing podcasts and learn about stuff that I've never heard of. Um, cause you just, you never know. I mean, there's so much stuff out there, literally, um, look at COVID just came out of nowhere, <laughs> but, um, I thank you so much for joining today and hopefully we have touched other mothers. Um, if anyone else is going through um, HLHS or any other conditions for that matter, like moms, just try to be strong. I'm not going to say continue to be strong, but try to be strong and just remain hopeful and prayerful if that's something that you're into. Um, but again, thank you. And this was an episode on the strength of a mother. So as always, stay motivated and stay bossy. Until next time, ladies. The Boss Mom Movement Podcast can be found on Apple and Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, YouTube, and Spotify. Make sure you subscribe and tune in every Sunday.